Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome a special guest from over in the US coming out of their crypto castle. So that's uh, Jeremy, one of the founders of Olga, who also runs a venture fund now in the crypto space. So we've got plenty to talk about today. So thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks for having me. So do you want to tell anyone that hasn't followed your story a, a quick background of how you got into Ethereum and then started Olga and then venture capital investing? Sure. I mean, it was a long winding path, uh, <laughs> as most paths are in the crypto space. I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011 when the Silk Road came up. I uh, thought Bitcoin was kind of dumb. Uh, internet money sounded difficult and hard to use, but the Silk Road was cool, <laughs> at least back then. Uh, but never, never actually bought Bitcoin at that point. And then in 2013, as the markets really started to form, uh, I did buy some. Everything went to like $1,000 what in what felt like overnight, and I ended up buying. Uh, and then I transferred to the University of Michigan, where I happened to just move in with a young Bitcoin enthusiast that encouraged me to join the University of Michigan Bitcoin Club. Joined the Bitcoin Club there, learned there were Bitcoin clubs at MIT and Stanford, brought them together. Uh, created a nonprofit, which is now known as the Blockchain Education Network. Uh, it spread across the planet. And through that nonprofit, I met my co founder of what would become Augur, Joey Krug. Uh, he is an 18 year old computer, computer scientist at Pomona at the time. And we ended up dropping out of school together. Uh, we initially, with our team, tried to build Augur on, on Bitcoin, in fact but realized it wasn't really good for building decentralized applications and thus ended up moving to Ethereum nine months before Ethereum even launched. Yeah, and, and then from there you got into venture capital investing and you guys run a fund that's exposed to Bitcoin and a lot of altcoins, which is a bit uh, topical at the moment. Yeah, so it, once again, the path was quite winding. Uh, joined Blockchain Capital as an entrepreneur in residence. Uh, they were pretty bearish on Ethereum at the time. But due to the success of the Augur ICO uh, and what we had built, they brought me on board. I ended up starting a magazine called Distributed, 108-page primer on blockchain technology, a company called Sava, which is a legacy database security company that uses blockchain tech. Uh, and then in late 2017, um, because I had put pretty much every penny I had ever made into crypto, uh, you know, I had become fairly wealthy and was able to create my own fund focused on the intersection of blockchain technology, crypto assets, and a broad definition of what I call social impact. So how do you view that space at the moment? Because I know altcoins are taking a beating and even Ethereum is you know, not really doing that well at the moment. But um, so sort of how do you view it? Is it just having to wash out all the rubbish projects and then the good ones are going to shine? And is that just going to take some time? Yeah, I mean, I think that is the evolution we've seen historically uh there are these big bull markets all these kind of garbage crypto assets inflate in value all these crypto traders emerge and then all of a sudden everyone realizes it's just a, a massive trash dump <laughs> and eventually you know there's a thinning out and the thinning out has appeared to have recurred uh, most recently and there are a lot of people that are now newfound bitcoin maximalists that believe that there that there will only be one true chain i have a hard time believing that uh i i just don't see a protocol for the disintermediation of middleman mm. being limited to an individual Blockchain. I, I, I think there will be multiple protocols, multiple blockchains. Uh, and now I think believe there will be interoperable, but there won't be just one. Now, what the winning chains will be is unclear. But even as far back as I'd say 2016, I would say in 2015, I, I envisioned a world with six to 12 blockchains. Maybe today it's closer to six. Uh, but my thesis really hasn't changed over time because I think there will be a need for different sort of value protocols. Like I understand why there's one internet 
there, because there really only needs to be one information protocol, but value can be delivered and realized in so many different ways that I think there will be multiple value protocols. Yeah, there's a good report by Electric Capital out recently, and they were saying that um, you know Ethereum's got four times as many developers as Bitcoin, let alone you know ten times more than the next other protocols. So, do you think that Ethereum is still you know a few years ahead of the rest of them, and is that one of the ones you're still most confident yeah. in? So it depends how you quantify ahead. Uh, Ethereum was built very much um, in honor of Bitcoin to a certain extent. Uh, it, it was built as a censorship, decentralized protocol, not for money, but for applications. And what all the subsequent blockchains have emerged since have compromised on is that decentralization and censorship resistance for the speed and scalability that Ethereum currently lacks. Yeah. And so you have these new protocols that are faster uh, and they are more scalable, but they compromise on the very purpose of blockchain technology, yeah. which is which is censorship resistance and decentralization. And so I find that problematic. And thus, there's no, I, I, there's nobody I would bet on before Ethereum after Bitcoin, simply because there's nobody that has solved the problems that Ethereum's trying to solve while still retaining those essential features of and do you think now that we've seen Libra and a few of these other chains pop up, you know, Binance chain, do you think that's sort of people are realizing that scale that you're talking about where, oh, hey, yeah, yes, there's EOS and there's there's NEO, but it's really all about decentralization, as you were sort of just saying? Well, so Libra plays a big role in how I think about all of this because with Libra, it's going to be scalable. It's going to be fast. It's not going to be censorship resistant, and it's not going to be decentralized. And I think I think everyone can agree on that. So the question is, for all those blockchains that came after Ethereum that uh, uh, plan to solve Ethereum's problems but compromised on those core values, uh, does Libra pretty much annihilate them all? Uh, that's kind of my assumption right now. Uh, I, I, there may be a room for one or two scalable blockchains that are not Libra, but I think uh, Ethereum is going to capture that censorship resistant category for applications. Bitcoin will capture that for money. And then Libra can really capture a massive amount of the market that wants a blockchain or a distributed database, if you will, uh, of for all those other applications that a lot of the new blockchain developers have been flaunting. Yeah. So let's uh, go back and talk about Bitcoin because I know you were saying in another interview that you're super confident in Bitcoin and you know, you're know you not as confident, I guess, in these other altcoins, but I guess that comes back to risk and reward because I think the percentage term gains from some of the current prices are probably going to outpace Bitcoin or do you still think that Bitcoin could offer the best rewards and is the safest play? I think that's hugely improbable. I mean, my my the market cap at the end of the day, you know, when Bitcoin re receives close to its full potential or achieves close to its uh, its full potential, mm -hmm. I believe is around twenty trillion dollars, which is a lot of money, <laughs> and it's a it's a big multiple from where it is now. However, relative to the potential value of other crypto assets, I think, especially in the short to medium term, there's probably more upside than others. But Bitcoin is far and away the safest bet. Yeah, and still has 
very likely eye-watering returns in the near future. Yeah, I tend to agree. So, um, yeah, let's chat about Olga because that's sort of been one that's, um, you know, been around for a while now and we've seen a few interfaces come and go already. I think they're a little bit ahead of their time, but recently we've seen things like, you know, Twitter integration and some other projects doing some cool stuff built on top of Olga. So do you think it is just still too early for people to be actually using this stuff or is it finally getting there? So when we founded Augur back in 2014 and then 2015 when I was on the road show, uh, I would often say I don't think it's going to be probably a decade until something like Augur achieves its potential. So much at the human level, social level has to change. This awareness of the surveillance state that we live in, of surveillance capital that exists, uh, for people to really want a platform for Augur. And then the UI, the UX needs to get better. Uh, the same problem that exists with all uh, blockchain technologies, which is uh, uh, public and private key uh, cryptography. Uh, we haven't really solved that and, and made this tech usable. Uh, I think Augur is very early on. They, they've been very smart about the runway. And I just... I. There was no world in which I ever thought Augur was going to be an overnight success. There are areas where, you know, I wish adoption could have been faster. The Frankly, like, Ethereum hasn't scaled to the extent where Augur could really be that useful for the masses. You know, until it's easy to integrate a stable coin, which is coming really shortly, until it's easy to access Augur without using, like, uh, any sort of extensions in your web browser. Um, like, until there's a marketing budget, like most gambling websites, you know, it's going to be very difficult for Augur to achieve its full potential. But I haven't sold a single rep token that, that I received as a founder. My fund holds a very sizable position, and I'm very bullish on its long-term potential. I mean, there... I think one of the realities of crypto assets is that there's a huge first mover advantage. You know, we've seen this with Bitcoin, we've seen this with Ethereum, we've seen this with Ripple and Litecoin. Like, if you're the first new type of blockchain or pseudo blockchain, it gives you a huge leg up in market capitalization, community, uh, and long term viability. Uh, tech doesn't really always win. It's really whoever moves first. So you guys are... And Augur was the first mover in real bona fide decentralized prediction. Yeah, market. I was just going to say, so you guys are planning on integrating DAI from Maker fairly soon? Yeah, that's happened. I, I, you know, I haven't been involved in a hands-on manner in quite some time with Augur, but uh, the, the roadmap has it planned for this fall. Yeah, so yeah, you mentioned decentralization and censorship resi resistance. All that stuff is sort of coming into that mainstream narrative a little bit more. We see stuff like you know the yellow vests and Hong Kong protests. Do you think the sort of the next generation of people is waking up to all this stuff and the games that a few of the big tech giants have been playing? And is that sort of what motivates you to build these sort of applications? If you look at the response to Libra, even. How, how much people really dislike and distru mistrust Facebook. I think it's a sign that people are becoming aware. But if you think about the developed world, you know, we have it pretty good, you know, Western Europe, the United States, or most of North America, you know, I don't think the Orwellianism that has creeped into our society is going to change consumer behaviors anytime soon. Uh, it, it, it may, especially if like all of a sudden a country stop printing cash and they go all digital, and all of a sudden every transaction we make is being monitored, mm -hmm. which we're seeing in more authoritarian countries. Uh, but frankly, I think most of the great applications of blockchain technology say for a few examples like Augur, are really going to be realized in the developing world, in Latin America, uh, in Africa, the Mideast, South Asia. Uh, I, I think that's where so much more potential lies uh, in the medium term here. Now, now, 
how things develop in the developed world, it's very hard to say. I, I you know, there, there's an awareness, but even like I think about someone like myself, like I'm acutely aware of uh, uh, of how little sovereignty I have online, how badly my privacy is being invaded, and how much am I really changing my behave, behavior to counter that? Not much. You have, you have to be so willing to sacrifice comfort for security that I don't think most people operate that way. It, it goes against our instincts. Humans just want to be comfortable. And so it would take some massive failures on the ends of of governments and tech companies to really push people in the developed worlds towards the technology really soon. Yeah. But I, I think, but I, th- I think certain crackdowns on certain technologies could create a move to decentralization faster than expected. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're aware, but in Australia, they've started these sort of um, monitoring programs with the cameras, the same as we have in China. And they're talking about banning cash transactions. Initially, it was $10,000, but they're talking about bringing that down to $2,000 and they want to include cryptocurrencies in that. So, And you and you guys have been talking about banning encryption, which is this talk that the, 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 the crypto wars of the 90s are coming back with the vengeance in the developed world. And I don't think they'll win. I think it's just it's farcical to suggest that you know you could ban encryption and and have online communications be safe at mm-hmm. all. Uh, but it, 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 it's concerning. I mean, you know, politicians tend not to be representative of the younger generations and tend not to be aware of the exponential curve that technology is on and, and, and can't keep up. And that's deeply problematic. We need younger politicians. We need younger bureaucrats working in government around the world to help cover governments not make just really idiotic mistakes like that. Yeah. Banning and well, We're already seeing a lot of young people move to startups, um, move their startups to Southeast Asia out of Australia. So is there anything else we haven't spoken about today, Jeremy, that you're really passionate about or want to touch on? Well, you know, I, I I think what I'm seeing in crypto today is 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 really reminiscent of uh, 2015, 2016. It's kind of boring. Uh, it's not that it's dead. Like 2015, 2016, people said crypto was dead. Uh, it, no one's really saying that now. Uh, but in 2015, 2016, a large a lot of large enterprises, banks, tech companies, retailers started talking about blockchain technology, yeah. not Bitcoin. And doing all these proof of concepts that weren't really realized. Now what you see in 2018, 2019 is those same sorts of pr- proof of concepts are actually now being implemented. But once again, they're not really sexy. They're blockchain-y, not Bitcoin-y. Uh, they don't feel revolutionary per se. Uh, and I think it's a harbinger of what's to come. I think that it will mean that this technology is going to be adopted in a dramatic fashion in a way we can't really fathom but it's gonna appear really unsexy until it just kind of hits us in the face how big this actually is and i think i think libra could be a massive catalyst if they can deal with all the regulatory scrutiny they're dealing with right now. absolutely well mate you're at the crypto castle i'll let you get back to it in a second but i just wanted to ask you what's the crypto castle all about for those that haven't read is it just a party house or is it trying to get startups to come and use blockchain or so the first crypto castle in san francisco was really just a joke i mean we had a dingy two-bedroom apartment for six people for, for auger before we'd raised any money that we called the bitcoin basement i like alliteration and then we raised a bit of money, and we got a three-bedroom house that we turned into seven, and I jokingly called it the Crypto Castle. Journalists who didn't really feel like explaining crypto, but were assigned to the crypto beat, they would come to our house and write about a house full of crypto enthusiasts rather than trying to explain the technology, and they'd still get the clicks they yeah. wanted. Uh, but then obviously as the industry evolved, I made money. Uh, I started to realize I probably didn't want to be based in San Francisco, I started thinking about moving elsewhere, ended up in Miami, started to think I could maybe recreate uh, the Crypto Castle here. And the Crypto Castle in San Francisco has been incredible. It's generated, you know, 
hundreds of millions of dollars worth of startups. It's minted nearly a dozen millionaires and multimillionaires uh, for this like pretty shabby house. Uh, but, the, but this how this house in Miami, which is very much more like a castle, uh, it's more for the more established folks I know in crypto, the guys that have made their money that want a crash pad, uh, you know, fully loaded. It's got the booze, it's got the food. There's, I always know where the party is if people want to go out. Uh, and to a certain extent, you know, it it it's a, it lives up more to the notoriety of the crypto castles. But at the same time, I mean, there's still just always incredible people coming through, ideating, creating, uh, doing deals together, really thinking about the future of this technology and the future of the planet. And that's really fun. I mean, it's why I'm doing a TV show now called The Crypto Castle Chronicles. Uh, The first episode, the pilot episode, should actually come out tomorrow. And, you know, I think what you'll see on the show is really something more than just a party house. It's a, a place where, like, really fascinating people come together and try to build something greater than themselves, which is, you know, I think the most important underlying underlying drive uh, in humanity. Awesome. Well, guys, I'm, I'm probably going to upload this a bit later, so I'll put a link below to the show once this is out and um, to, to follow right. you, Jeremy. So thanks so much for joining us today, mate. Really, uh, really, really appreciate that. My pleasure. I was happy to be thanks, on. Guys.